Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Today we have episode 224, Stop Forgetting Jiu-Jitsu Stuff. Uh, Today I'm joined by my partners in crime, Joe Thomas and Byron Jabara. How are you two doing today? I'm doing good, Gary. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. Thank you. Yep, I'm also doing good. Happy to be on here. We got the three amigos teamed up again. We don't get this every week, but when we can, it's awesome. Yeah, didn't you say last week instead of three amigos, we were the Destiny's Child of the podcast? I thought you said that, Gary. Or the Three's Company. <laughs> or, as Joe said, the Charlie's Angels. There we go. R2D2, yep. C3PO, and the little one on the ball. Byron, you were the one on the ball, I hope. (laughs) (laughs) I am sitting down. Anyway, we've got a a fun show here. What's the idea behind the show? Today, uh, you know, you hear it all the time. Uh, People teach you something in jiu-jitsu. You learn something, and you learn a new drill. You learn a new move, and uh, you come into the next practice, and you forget it all. So, uh, you know, we're going to, you know, try to give some tips so that you'll retain what you've learned and uh, be able to carry that over in all your training sessions and competitions. So uh, hopefully uh, we won't forget jujitsu stuff today. Yeah, we've got a lot of jujitsu stuff to talk about, but we do have an off-the-mat lesson. We like to look at kind of situations that happen in real life and then drag them back onto the mats and, and see, oh, well, how could this affect jujitsu or how could this affect what's going on where I train. And I was at work the other day talking with another firefighter, and he was out of his station. He was working at a different station, and he I asked him how long he's been doing that. And that happens from time to time. You get too many guys at one station, you kind of send one where they're a little thin, or maybe somebody was sick that day. Not a big deal. But he had been doing this for two months. That's a long time. A couple of weeks is, is pretty normal to, to kind of rotate who gets sent out and, and who works at different stations. But he had been doing this for about two months. I said, what's the deal with that? He said, I must have made somebody upset, but I don't know what happened. Like, Man, that's too bad. And so we got talking about it, and, and what do you think happened? And he has a couple ideas, but he really doesn't know like why he's being punished and, and why he's not able to go back to his normal station. And I, bringing it, dragging this back out to the mat, you get those guys who who roll a little too rough or maybe say something that bothers you while you're rolling and the quick response is just to just try to smash them or, or or just roll differently with that person and not tell them. Well, that's similar to the guy who's, who's not at his station. Out of sight, out of mind. His his captain, his lieutenant said, okay, this guy has upset us. Let's, let's kick him out of here for a couple of months and uh, kind of punish him that way and, and maybe he'll figure it out when he gets back. How's he supposed to figure that out? The same thing when you're smashing the guy on the mat. Let's say... He, he, I don't know, he doesn't wear deodorant. He smells bad, so you avoid rolling with him all the time. Or he's always elbowing you in the face. Or, you know, he's he's, grind, he's trying to pressure point you all the time. Or just something that's annoying. If you don't actually talk to the person, hey, man, you know, this is a close contact thing. A lot of us will take a shower before we come in here because, we, you know, we don't want to offend anybody because, you know, we are close to get close to or whatever. Just a little bit of communication goes a long ways as far as helping somebody understand, oh, that's why nobody rolls with me, because I haven't showered at all today, and even yesterday I skipped shower, and I'm the smelly guy, and I don't even know it. it just that communication helps people understand what's going on, and I and I feel bad for the, the people who don't get that, and I've definitely been in a place where, like, I don't want to roll with that guy, he's the smelly guy. But <laughs> the proper thing to do is to talk to them and say, and, and find a way that's tactful, And some people are better at this than others, so it's not a role for everyone to fill. But, you know, maybe you have somebody who could just kind of mention it. You know, you don't want to embarrass anybody in front of a big group. But just, hey, man, every time I roll with you, I get racked. What's uh, Can we figure out how that's happening and not do that? Because I'm not here to get racked. I'm trying to preserve things down there uh, like a wildlife sanctuary. And (laughs) it's just the actual communication versus rolling harder, being, you know, a jerk back to them or smashing them and not letting them get a chance or just not rolling with them at all. That's a big deal as far as the long-term health of a gym. And if you talk to them and their behavior doesn't change, talk to them again, 
And after a while, it's like, okay, this person clearly doesn't want to change what they're doing. And, you know, that could be dealt with in other ways, but you don't need to keep <laughs> having somebody rack you every time you roll or a guy who's horribly smelly when he walks in every time. Uh, that's not really appropriate for jujitsu. Yeah, that's a good one, Byron. That reminds me of an interaction I had at class last night. I rolled with the white belt, and uh, I recognized him, but I couldn't really remember how I'd met him. After class, he said, it was good to meet you again. And I said, yeah, good to meet you. And he says, I remember last time I rolled with you, I choked you. And I thought to myself, that doesn't sound right. And he said, uh, he showed me what he did. And then I remembered, I rolled with him, and he did you know, what they call a rape choke, where he just grabbed my throat with his hand. <laughs> and uh, he said, I don't do that anymore. So whatever I said to him afterwards, I guess it was the right thing, because we're still friends, and he doesn't <laughs> do it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and if you just, you know, would have just lit him up with arm bars like crazy and, and obviously I don't remember what he, what he said but or what you guys talked about, but he wouldn't have known why as far as, actually, you know, you could do that. It's kind of annoying. It doesn't really work that well against a trained judicial person, and I could show you why, but really you should try, work on passing the guard or, or do something more productive. I know it's difficult. I don't know. <laughs> it, probably was from with, it probably was from inside my guard, too. <laughs> and he probably got arm barred, I'd imagine. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But, Byron, you brought up a good point where you were talking about uh, the person who talks to the, the stinky guy or the smelly guy or, or the guy from the wildlife sanctuary. Um, <laughs> you, well, yeah. So that, you know, we definitely, you know, we talk about schools all have their own enforcer, but we should also have, you know, maybe a communicator, you know, might be good, too. Uh, you know, the enforcer is probably the guy who's going to get people to quit. But. You know, you think about the the person who is the communicator, you know, that is good at that. Uh, you know, somebody just may not know they stink or, you know, need to wash their, their gi more or put some deodorant on. And, and they could end up being a great training partner. But, uh, you know, we may run them out uh, without, you know, telling them, like you said, that guy that, well, you know, was moved around from different stations, you know. So definitely need somebody to communicate what's going on. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people don't know that. And, uh, you know, so they can't correct that behavior. Yeah, you mentioned the gi. Uh, I've had that conversation. You, you, I have it about every four or five months. Somebody comes in, their gi smells. Do you wash your gi? Yeah, I wash my gi every time. Typically, there's some step they're missing as far as letting it, you know, dry as quickly as they can, hang dry it, and put a fan or in use it or water. something. Use water yeah. or some sort of a detergent. Uh, they're just missing a step in there, and they don't realize it. And so, help them out. You know, communicate with words. Don't just avoid rolling with the person because they their gi smells bad. Uh, and yeah, then they're, they've yeah. gone nose blind. It feels fine. It smells fine to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happened to me. That's, that's the way I permanently am anyway. But I just thought that was a, a thing, you know, in a way you're kind of punishing somebody without telling them why. And that's not really an effective way to, to work with people. Right. So it sounds like what you're talking about is a station with a good culture versus one that's uh, not so good. And that uh, brings us to the quote of the week. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. And the way I understand it, this is a business quote. Uh, I thought Gary might be familiar with it being a banker. But basically, if you've got a business that's failing or struggling, you can bring in all kinds of good business strategy. But if the workers have a culture of just doing the bare minimum, you know, wanting to come in late, leave early blame other people for their problems. It doesn't matter how good your strategies are, they're always gonna fail. And I, and I think this is true in a gym as well. You've gotta have a good culture, uh, people helping people, sharing information, training hard together, being considerate of each other. Those things are all a lot more important, I think, than coming in with a good lesson plan every day. What do you guys think? Man, I totally agree with you, Joe. You know, you were talking about people helping people. And that's the one thing that, you know, I love about jiu-jitsu so much. You're always seeing, you know, the, the the world champion help out the brand new guy. And, it you know, it goes back to kind of like what you were saying about the guy who tried to rape joke you. You know, you would, you know, talk to him and, you know, he was happy to see you and everything. And he stopped doing that, that bad behavior. You know, people helping people. You helped him out. You know, he's changed his, his you know whatever was do whatever he was doing was bad you know he's a good training partner but uh jiu-jitsu is just so great in that thing uh, the culture of that gym uh people helping people sharing information you know i go to a seminar 
you know, two states away and I learned some cool stuff. I don't come back and just hide it and just use it for myself so that I can tap Joe and Byron out. First thing I'm going to do is show it to Joe and Byron. Like, hey, check out this new move I got. And uh, who knows, Joe or Byron may hit it on me. And I'm like, hey, great job, guys. It's uh, We're all just making each other better. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that, uh, you know, culture whole, or that quote wholeheartedly. It's a great quote. Come on, Gary. You don't keep that secret technique to yourself for at least a week or two. <laughs> you know, I should, but I, I'm I'm too nice. I think. Awesome. Yeah. The, basically, it's saying that the culture of an organization is more important than the uh, un, the strategies that they're trying to follow. And if you look at it backwards, you know, it, somebody has a real great strategy in their the the culture is a show. You know. People show up nine to five. They they work. They don't, you know. They have some bad attitudes. They have, um, you know, that sort of thing going on. Kind of a toxic environment. It's, who cares what the strategy is? Like it's not going to work. You need people who, uh, a lot of places don't even have really a culture that they just people show up and go to work, collect a paycheck, and go home. So developing a culture, having it be a good one, uh, yeah, it's going to be having just a strategy of of employees that uh, hate each other every time. <laughs> well, you, you know, I think of the podcast just like this too. You know, you're talking about, you know, culture versus strategy. And, you know, I know that's one of the things that used to just be like a wild jungle in here, like you were saying. And, you know, we ended up getting Joe. We ended up not being all together when we're doing this. And, uh, you know, we got a good strategy and we changed our culture around because, you know, you were always saying it's just like a jungle. No, Nobody knows what's going on. And it's made a big difference. Hey, this is Byron from the editing room. And uh, just jumping in here to explain something that's not going to make a whole lot of sense unless I do. Uh, before the podcast, I connected with Gary on Skype and we were waiting for Joe to get on. And we discussed a little prank we could do on Joe, and Gary was going to play some some animal noises, some dogs, and act like he's got just a madhouse of a bunch of animals. Well, it really didn't go anywhere, and Joe never commented on it. And uh, until now, you know, Gary plays a noise of a lion roaring, which is really kind of hard to hear. That's the thing. A lot of these is hard to hear, actually, on the podcast. So you might have heard a couple of chirps or something like that in the first part of the show, but Probably most people didn't hear that either. So uh, this probably is the worst prank ever because, uh, as Joe describes, he knew about it the entire time. So we kind of, you know, have a good time with that. I figured I'd leave it in and uh, just play it as is. But I'll back up a little bit and we'll get a running start and listen for the little lion roar. And then we talk about how bad this prank actually was strategy and we changed our culture around because you know you were always saying it's just like a jungle no nobody knows what's going on and it's made a big difference <laughs> all right gary what is that noise in the background now <laughs> oh it was a wild jungle <laughs> that was a lion roaring okay i'm gonna give up on this um <laughs> <laughs> we tried uh so all of gary's dog noises before the show were fake like Joe didn't know that. <laughs> you, you know, Byron, you called me before you guys were done discussing your little prank. Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it had gone through. <laughs> Joe's like, these guys are just dumb as a <laughs> box of rocks. dumbest rock. prank ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Byron, yeah, tell Joe the prank. It, it never and showed then, him like, that uh, it was, it was uh, it <laughs> completed the call. <laughs> Yeah, I answered the call for about eight seconds. I listened to you guys talking about Gary's fictitious dogs out in the yard. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, that's funny. That's even better. Okay, back on you, Gary. We had planned it all along. Jokes on you. Yep. Good job, Joe and Byron. I was in on that. The part of ruining yeah. your joke, Gary. Yeah. Oh, and I couldn't really hear. I can't really hear Gary's fictitious dog. They're noises. pretty quiet. Oh, okay. I heard the lion though. Okay, good. At least that one worked. <laughs> this is Byron again from the editing room. Just wanted to throw in a quick programming note. Finally, we have bonus episodes, as in more than one every Monday. We're going to start a thing where we do two episodes the first week of the month. And the episode that we're adding is kind of a Joe's episode. We're all three going to be there. Joe does the interview. It's a lot of fun. A little different format. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. So next week, we have started our bonus episodes.
I think we should just forget about the jungle theme that we've just been talking about. And let's get on to the topic of the day and stop forgetting the jujitsu you know. Yeah, that's a big problem I've had is I I often will just totally forget what I learned the day before, the week before. We come back from a seminar and everybody, you know, at my school went to it and like, okay, let's review. Oh yeah. Uh what did we learn? That's not a very good way to, to add techniques to your game. It just you know, forgetting them right away. And I've found some tricks to help me remember. And I assume Gary and Joe, you have as well. But uh, yeah, it, it's a, it, you know, remembering, we're trying to learn something here. And, you know, with learning something, you have to be able to remember what you're being shown in order to actually learn anything. <laughs> uh, one of the the big ones is to take some notes, to write some stuff down, make a little journal about what's happening. I don't know that, Going back and checking your journal is the you know the 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 thing that is the key there. The act of writing it down, the act of thinking about it, putting it in your own words. I think that's the shortcut to helping you have a better memory. Making that note helps, and then you know if you make it in a way you can figure out what you're talking about. And oh, what was that armbar? And you go back and you look, and it was armbar from sides. Which you know go around and have some details in there. Then it makes sense. I think that that writing some stuff down is a big way to help you remember things, whether it be just like a daily class journal you keep or something you pull out for seminars when you learn like a overwhelming amount of stuff at one point in time. I was going to say, I do see the people that it seems like uh, they keep a journal with them, you know, at practice, uh, you know, all the time and, and, you know, during little breaks are always going and writing stuff. It seems, you know, when I see those people, they do retain that information a lot more. And when I first started, I was really big at not using a journal. And, you know, I was told over and over again to journal. And, uh, you know, I just something that didn't seem that it would work for me. And I really never used a journal till I started this podcast. And, you know, I started using a journal just, you know, listen to the interviews with, you know, some of these superstars we've had on and, and just, you know, just jotting down little things that they've said. Um, and just little things like that have, has, have helped my game. And I have got r- more into journal and stuff where, you know, Byron may show me a move and, you know, and I- I'll practice it a couple of times. I won't let Byron just show it to me once. I'll try it, you know, four or five times. And this is an informal setting, let's say. And, you know, in a formal setting, I'm not drilling it as much. So, you know, I'll keep it in my head in the minute you know, I do get a chance. I'll write that down in my own words. Like Byron said, you have to write it in a way that'll make sense to you. So that means for me, right after I write it, I have to look at it again. Does it make sense? Uh, you know, what I first wrote down, I may not be able to retain, you know, what had happened. I may not have done a good enough job explaining it. So then I'll read it again and I'll see, man, is there something I could have changed? Does that make sense? Do I think it's going to make sense, you know, when I get home after a couple hours and, you know, right off the bat, I try to look at it again, um, you know, within, you know, three or four hours and and try to keep it in my head. And and then every now and then I go back and I I just kind of review it, you know, like a periodic review. I don't I don't have a set timetable, but I just think going back, just looking through my notes, if I have you know, five minutes of free time and I'm just sitting there on the couch, I just pull it out and uh, just go back over some of that stuff. And uh, it's done wonders for me to uh, to retain that information. Do you use pen and paper, Gary? I use pen and paper. You know, I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, apps and, uh, you know, stuff of that sort. But Byron knows I'm really old school and pen and paper works best for me. Yeah, I think I'm kind of old school, too, but I prefer the apps for this just because I can't carry a pad of paper in my gym bag. I mean, I get I get so sweaty, and if I have paper in there, it's just gonna it's gonna be a mess. So I (laughs) I uh, I prefer apps, and you know, there's some that you can make a template, and then it's just kind of fill in the blank. One is Evernote, and I think the guy that there was a guy you had as a guest before I started coming on, yeah, and he made a nice template, and that's something that I've used from time to time. And for me, that's simpler, and I don't have a wet wad of paper in my gym bag. Yeah, definitely. Uh, check out Evernote because I have looked at that. It, it looks awesome, and I have heard a lot of people say good stuff about that. So besides making some notes about things, 
How else do you guys remember a technique? Let's say you see something and you're like me, you'll forget it if you don't actually purposely try to make a mental note or remember something. How do you guys keep that technique in your mind? You know, I think one of the big things is, you know, just drilling it over and over again. Um, you know, I see something and, you know, let's say it's, uh, you know, I see a training partner pull something off and, you know, I'm going to ask them what they did. And when they show it to me, you know, I see it. I see this a lot. Somebody shows you a move and, and I'm, I'm a very slow learner, but I see somebody show a move. I see somebody drill it once and they think they have it. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of Byron when, uh, the second Rolly Delgado seminar we did. And Byron was my partner in this one. And, you know, there was a lot of people in this seminar, tons of people, and anybody who gets a chance to go to a Rolly Delgado seminar, it's it's going to be incredible, so uh, don't miss it. But we were doing, uh, uh, this one was a illegal leg locks. And, you know, the, the great thing uh, I having a good partner like Byron is, Byron and I just drilled over and over again. When I was looking around, I don't think anybody put in the amount of reps that Byron and I did. And I'm a big believer in just rep and rep and rep and just do it over and over again. Um, you know, I know a lot of people would stop and, you know, talk or felt like they did it too many times. I'm going to take every second that I have and just keep doing it over and over again. And I like people to do it to me. You know, I, I, that's kind of like reverse engineering. Like I don't want to hog all the reps when people are doing it to me. I see it from the other way too. It just more ingrains into my mind. And then, um, you know, not just putting in those reps, but, you know, working on it for, you know, not just that day, but, you know, Byron has really, you know, cemented this into my head, work on it for a long time. You know, it could be two weeks, it could be two months, but don't just, you know, put in a whole bunch of reps one day, you're going to forget it. Um, you know, come back your, your next practice, put in some more reps. Uh, you know, when I'm at home sometimes and, and I'm thinking about it in my head, you know, I've got my 10 year old boy here and, uh, I'll start throwing some reps on him. And it's just, just the more I do it, the more reps I put in, the more I remember it and uh, it just makes it so much easier for me. You know, something we do at my home gym that I really like that I think is helpful with this. We do a period where we do technique. The instructor shows it and, and we just, you know, drill the technique a little bit. And then before we get to open mat, we do positional sparring and we start in whatever position the technique was shown from. And that gives you an opportunity. I mean, if you if your instructor shows you a technique from butterfly guard and you roll all night long with guys that can just crush a butterfly guard, you're not really going to be able to set that up. But if the object is to do some positional sparring where you start in butterfly guard and if the guy passes, then you start back in butterfly guard, it gives you an opportunity to look for that technique in a you know, semi-live setting. And to me, that's a great way to make sure that you remember that technique. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I really do think that helps me a lot. And the other thing I've noticed during this podcast is a lot of the very high level people we've talked to, um, you know, from Tim Sled on, it seems like they're always talking about positional sparring. And when I hear so many incredible people talk about positional sparring has made a big deal for them, that's definitely something that, uh, you know, I knew I was lacking and I, I have tried to do more. So uh, great point there, Joe. One thing I do when I'm trying to remember a technique is I try to link it to another technique. So uh, let's say it's a side control thing, and you know I, I like hidden arm choke from side, and you know Gary's showing me a Kimura. Well, it's like okay, okay. Well, maybe if I can't do a head and arm uh, thing, so this will be something I could try, and then I'll try to add the details from there. But uh, for me, a lot of it is remembering to do something. So when I'm rolling with somebody trying to work on that head and arm choke and they're denying me access. It's like, Oh yeah, I was going to think about the Kimura now. And then I'll, and like just that little trigger helps me to, to remember to try something that I just recently learned. Haven't really added to my game yet because it's not automatically coming to my mind, but just that little mental trigger of, Hey, yeah, when I was here, I was going to do something else. It was this. And that'll get you doing those techniques while you're actually rolling and I think that's a that's a big thing. The same thing as positional sparring. If you could do them on a on a training, you know, resistant partner, it's way better. It helps you. You re, it's almost like you respect the technique better. Like it worked, or it almost worked. And it's and your brain will say that's something I got to do again. 
versus if you do it a couple times in class with a, a buddy who's not giving you any resistance and they just let you, your brain doesn't necessarily think that that's going to be a great technique because you've seen you know, hundreds of techniques that you've done it with and then you tried them once or twice and they didn't really pan out. But if you can pull them off while you're actually dealing with a resistant partner, it's a it's something for me in a way my brain will just gravitate towards remembering that and, and liking that technique a lot more. Yeah, I like that. Another thing we do at my home gym, if we're going to do a Kimura from the guard when we're drilling it, we always start with your opponent takes you down with a double leg. You know, and so he takes you down with the double leg, you secure the guard, and then you go for the Kimura. And I think that kind of sets up in your mind when you're live rolling. As you're getting taken down, that Kimura is already coming to mind. And and I think that's another great way to uh, just link things together and have the whole thing make sense to you. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Like like you said, Joe, you, you get it in your head that as that double leg's coming, you're already you're knowing you're going to your back you're you're getting your you know guard position but you're not just worrying about getting in the guard you're already starting to think about you know hey let's get this elbow away from this body let's uh lock up the kimura grip and uh you know finish this so uh you know good point and joe i also want to bring up a point you were talking about on the positional sparring um you know you you mentioned a point that if you know a guy's got a really good or really good butterfly guard passer and he just passes my butterfly guard and uh you know without positional sparring, you know, how good does it do me? I don't get put in that position enough. You know, you're, he's just going to pass. He's going to take side mount. He's either going to control from there or start working submissions. And you may not get back into that position again. So you don't get to, uh, don't get a chance to do it. But I was thinking about, you know, myself, um, you know, I, I do like to do positional sparring, but when I am working on something, you know, and, and I will spend a long time working on one move. I may spend, you know, anywhere from a month to three or four months, just, you know, trying to get that move as many times as possible. But, you know, even after positional sparring, when we're rolling, you know, I try to get myself in that position as many times as possible. Like, I think if you're really working on something, you might want to not during your regular rolling, not worry as much about getting a tap, you know, and, and, you know, throw that ego away a little bit and try to, hit that move like byron was saying against a resisting opponent you know not just positional sparring but in your regular role i may have given up a chance to finish with a guillotine but i'm working on another move so you know i I put myself in that position and you know just keep troubleshooting out of there and that's another one that uh helps me you know just because i'm getting even more and more reps and you know against live opponents and different opponents because everybody's going to act a little bit differently and uh, it's just going to you know, just keep it fresh in my head and and I'm going to see all the different angles, um, and different ways that people are going to react. And, uh, you know, then I have to add a little bit of, uh, you know, changes to it, uh, depending on how people react. So, uh, um, that is another trick that I use there. Uh, One way that I've tried to remember things and it's not just jujitsu, but it's just things in general is I kind of put it through a thing of, uh, I verbalize it with my own words. And I think that helps. That also makes your brain kind of figure things out, how to explain this. And I I love it when people have um, words that are very descriptive. Like uh, the one that pops up in my head right now is just uh, Tim Sled, because you just mentioned it a little bit ago, Gary. I got his leg drag uh, workshop DVD, and he's very good at this. He, he mentions, like, staple the leg. And literally, uh, their leg is on the ground. And you're stepping over it. You're on your toes, and your and your knee is over it. Like your knees on the ground, your toes on the ground, and their leg is kind of in that void space that uh, that's in uh, on your shin. So it's like a staple, and so it's super simple to okay staple, and then you know, like that sort of thing. If you could put that into your own words or give yourself visual um, words like that, staple something. Okay, what am I? Okay, staples leg right here, and then what do I do? I you know turn or whatever is next. I think that that kind of verbalizing it in your own way or if they've already got clever uh, memory tricks as far as helping you visualize what's supposed to be happening, those are big. So uh, visualize something with actual words and then also like in your mind's eye, like think about how how does it work? I take this leg and move it over here. I then staple with this leg. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Another big one to help you remember something is to teach it. And this is like, what do you mean teach it? Good point. I, a lot of people are thinking, I just started six months ago. But really, you know, you partner up with somebody, 
and you really you're teaching each other. The instructor can't go around to all you know ten or thirty or fifty students in the class and reshow it. So really, the teacher will show you something, and then really for the two people that partner up, you're teaching each other. So make an effort to make sure they get it right, and that and they should help you get it right too. And so I think that's a big one is to actually try to teach it like you would, like you already understand it, and that'll help you as well. Byron, I think that's golden. One of the things you had on the list to talk about was seminars, and that I made that note next to seminars that you should go home and as soon as you can go to the very next class and, and 15 minutes early and, and get one of your friends and training partners and say, hey, let me show you what I learned at the seminar and spend 15 minutes going over it with them. If you go to a school that uh, allows lower belts to have – take part in the teaching and, and you feel comfortable with it, ask the instructor if you can show a technique that night. And yeah, I think that's key. It's really good. Another way that that's big for me is to review it later on. That's what you're talking about is um, <laughs> bring it back up. Some people, and, and I have an old coach, uh, Johnny Jiu-Jitsu, who you call him, um, he sees something once, he's got it. It's in his encyclopedia of Jiu-Jitsu that's way bigger than mine. I mean, he just knows a lot of techniques. But I need to review that later on. So letting that, you know, you go to bed, you know, get up, go to work, do some things, and then come back to it and review it. And kind of that, that bringing it up twice. It's not like we're trying to cram for a test, you know, at school. We actually want to remember these things. <laughs> so uh, that little review, it may not be as long. It may not be as detailed. But uh, I think the reviewing things is a big deal. And, you know, post-seminar, you know, the next day after class, what did we do yesterday? Let's talk about that again. Even uh, there's some there's a lot of value I think towards at the end of class. Okay, we showed three techniques. Let's review them real quick so everybody is back on the same page, and then go from there. So that little review sometimes I'll see like a, a week long review. What did we do this week? We did these three things each day. We we kind of touched on them and kind of a review for the recap for the week. I think reviews are a big deal as far as helping you remember things. Yeah, Byron, when you're saying review, are you talking about drilling it talking about looking at your journal or you know because what i was thinking of when you're saying they're just replaying it over and over in my head i just didn't know what way you were talking about reviewing it any way you could do it like yeah if yeah. if that's what if that's when you open your journal up you see okay we did uh, leg drags okay well i don't have anybody here with me now i'm kind of smelly and i guess everybody left because i just stunk them out of the house just review it in your head. Okay, how's the leg drag? Yeah. So I do this and that. Yeah. If if you've got a few minutes after class to review some stuff, that's awesome. However you do it, I think there'll be yeah. a benefit to helping you remember things. You know, I, I found, you know, as I'm going to bed at night, while I'm laying there, you know, getting ready to, you know, fall asleep, you know, instead of thinking about work or anything else, I'm always thinking about jujitsu. I'm thinking about, you know, if I'm thinking about a move, you know, where my hand should be, you know, what angle should I get? Do my hips need to be farther out? Do I need to set a hook? And, uh, um, you know, that has really helped me as I'm, you know, it calms me down and gets me ready to go to bed. But, you know, the last thing I'm doing before I, you know, go night, night is, uh, my brain is thinking about jujitsu and, uh, you know, just techniques or, you know, ways to get better. That sounds like a romance, jujitsu. <laughs> the last thing I think about before I go to sleep, and the first thing I think about when I wake up. <laughs> you know, uh, it's just funny. Like I think ever since I started doing jujitsu, I shrimp out of bed. You know, every time I I roll over, you know, my elbows are always tucked to my body. Uh, you know, every time I go for a hug, I'm looking for an underhook. I'm looking for head positioning. So, uh, you know, we're a little bit crazy when we start jujitsu. So is there a, a difference in trying to remember a technique as far as uh, just a submission, a choke or armbar, whatever, leg lock, versus an actual position that may be kind of foreign to you, and you're trying to remember the details behind the position? Are those the same thing as far as memory goes? I think it's probably the same, but, you know, the position is more meticulous. You know, there's, you know, probably more to it. You know, you just think about how many – different offense defense uh you know positioning you know body position you know hips high hips low um you know kind of even like joe was talking about in uh, about the guard you know how you know you're lined up uh you know center line and you know move northwest northeast or, or whatever but i just think it's I, I don't think there's any difference of remembering and i just think there's a lot more 
to remember when we talk about a, a position, you know, versus submission. Yeah, I think the uh, the way that you remember it's the same, but I think what you focus on remembering might need to be a little bit different. If you go to a seminar and, and they teach a series of moves from a position that you're not really familiar with, memorizing the series of moves is not going to do you a lot of good if you don't understand the fundamentals of the position. Great so, point. So like side control, you know, you need to be up on your side, up on your shoulder. You need to block the cross face, you know, defend against the underhook, get the underhook yourself if you can. Those are fundamental things that you you have to remember before you remember how to do a sweep from that position. Good point. Yeah, when Gary was showing me some leg lock stuff uh, last year, it he mostly focused on the position that he likes to, to attack the feet from. And once I was able to kind of get a grasp on that, he started showing me the details of how to get the submission. And there were two different things, I think, for the way I was trying to learn them because I really needed to maintain this position and hold it and, and understand how they're going to escape and how they're going to react. And, and, and then the submission, it just felt like, you know, do these six things and it's over. And I think there's, I don't know, it, it may be a little different because I wouldn't typically end up in that position unless I was going for the leg anyway. But um, if it's a new position altogether, it could be a bit confusing as far as, okay, I'm not used to this. What am I, okay, he can attack my feet too. Are you serious? Like, okay, got to watch out for that. <laughs> but I think it's a little harder to understand a, a new position because there's so much that can go uh, off of that as far as different attacks versus uh, a submission that has kind of an end point. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes when you get into that, and like you said, you're you're at a position that you're not feeling comfortable with, it, it's, I don't know, I just see sometimes it seems like everybody wants just the quickest answer. You know, what's the quickest submission from here? But, you know, kind of like what Joe says, it's, you know, before we can even work on submissions, we need to know the stuff. Like, you know, Joe was talking about side mount, defending the underhook, uh, you know, all that stuff before you can even look for the sweep. And, uh, you know, sometimes I just think it's in our head. We want the cool submission um, when we're working on that on on familiar position but we can't just jump ahead to the end you know this is a cool part we have to uh you know cement the basics down and and totally understand you know the ins and outs of that, of that position and where where that person's looking to take you to yeah we can get on our knees on the mat together facing each other and gary can show me how to do a cross collar choke and i can learn all the fine details of finishing that choke from that position but if i try and choke him out from the mount and I don't have a clue as to how to maintain the mount and how to distribute my weight. I'm just going to get rolled over and, and reversed every time. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good example there. It's going to be hard to to do that and remember the the techniques that you were shown because your mount's so terrible. Like you need to make that position valid before it's going to work as a as a mount attack, and you probably need to have a good guard pass in order to even get to the mount. <laughs> So. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to it. Yeah, it's a uh, that's why jujitsu is awesome. It's it's a nonstop learning process. Uh, even you know, once you become a black belt like you, Byron, you're you're still learning every single day. Brick by brick, baby. That's how we build this wall. <laughs> brick by <laughs> brick. <laughs> One of my favorite ways to teach. The only problem with this is it's very individual, and you can't teach a whole class like this in, in a day. But uh, and also one of my favorite ways to learn is to roll with somebody to find a behavior they're doing that could be corrected or whatever, capitalize on that, and then get there and get in the same position and then say, okay, hold on a minute. Last time you did this, I swept you. Um, here's what you could do differently. And then show them, kind of kind of pause the roll, talk about it, and then start the roll up again and, and get through this a couple of times. I think when a training partner gives you a, a tip – from rolling. I'm not talking about like, oh, Gary's choking me and I'm about to go sleep. And I say, hey, Gary, remember to, to do this with your wrist. And then he does it. I got a good job. You did it, Gary. Not talking about like getting out of a submission as far as coaching them, but actually helping out your teammate and, and giving them, you know, hey, you know why you've been choked with this twice already during the roll? It's because of this is happening. And, and here's a way to avoid that. And that feedback is, I think, easy to remember because it, that's maybe one reason I like to do it so much when I'm helping out somebody. And I also like getting that feedback because it's relevant to my game. It's personal. 
it, it, maybe nobody else is getting choked out the way I get choked out when I roll with Gary. But if Gary tells me, hey, you're, you're doing this, you got to not do that, at least when you roll with me, because I'm going to hit you every time. I'm going to remember that every time because I'm tired of getting choked out the same way. <laughs> but, you know, that goes back to uh, uh, Joe's quote there. You know, we're talking about culture. And, Byron, you were saying, you know, it's hard to teach a whole class like that. But if you do have a culture in your gym of, of people like Byron, of people like Joe, who aren't out for themselves, who are, you know, always trying to help their training partners get better and, and make their room tougher, you're going to have two, three, four, five people doing that at the same time. And, uh, you know, you've got Joe training with Billy over there and Joe's helping him out. Byron, you're doing it with uh, Bob and, uh, you know, everybody's helping each other out and saying, hey, you know, this is, you know, I, I just capitalized on this and I just choked you out because you did this. Let's get back in that position. Here's some tips. And, uh, you know, the whole room is just going to get tougher, you know, because your culture is so good and uh, everybody's just going to get that much better. I like it, Gary. That's a, that's a big thing because I can only teach one person, but if everyone's doing that and helping each other, the whole class is learning while they're actually sparring or drilling or positional sparring. Yeah, that's a lot of learning going on. And that's if I'm trying to guard pass and some guy sweeps me with, well, I'm, this happened a couple, I don't know if it was a year ago or so, but I'm like in it deep. I'm 80% down with my guard pass and I get swept. I'm like, what was that? And then, you know, okay, I get back up on top. I start passing again. And it happens again. And then he's like, okay, you know what's happening? And no, I don't have a clue what's happening. I thought I was doing good. <laughs> he showed me. And then I, it's like, the perfect thing to learn for me because he's just told me twice I've got a huge problem with this nobody else is really doing it to me but like it's clearly something I need to know about so that sort of thing those lessons are easy to remember easy to teach as long as you have somebody who is receptive to learning that way I think it's he awesome is receptive yeah. yeah you need to be coachable yeah. you know what I think is a great way to to roll like you're talking about, Byron. I remember when I was a white belt, and this has always stuck with me, and it's been six, seven years ago now. I was rolling with a black belt that uh, English wasn't his first language. He didn't speak hardly any English at all. And uh, <clears throat> so he's teaching me while we're rolling, and I'm in his guard, and he pulls my right arm across, gets my elbow across the center line, grabs my left lat with his arm, and, and sweeps me. And then we start rolling again, and immediately he pulls guard, and he pulls my right arm across, and I think, okay, I don't want this to happen. So I post out with my left leg to try and get leverage to pull my arm out. Of course, he just hooks the leg and scoops <laughs> me again. So then uh, he pulls guard again, grab, pulls the arm across, I put my leg out, and this time he just reaches out and kind of touches my leg for a second. And it's like, okay, no, I don't want to put my leg out. And he must have swept me six or seven times that roll with the same sweep, but every time he would pause a little bit, at certain points to like give me a chance to kind of digest and figure out what's going on. And I probably learned more in that role than I did the whole class. So it's a really, really great teaching technique. And, you know, you probably do that with some of the people you train with, you know, that are, you know, you're that much higher than them just because you remember how much you learned from this guy and, and how much it helps your game. Yeah. Sometimes uh, I like to play half guard. And uh, when I've got the underhook and the guy wizards me, sometimes I'm like, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and then I sweep them. I, I, you know, and I just do it because I think that that uh, makes the point. It's something they'll remember. You know, they take that yes. wizard and, and I make a point that you, you might have just made a mistake. And then I sweep them and, and I hope that sticks with them and they'll learn from it. There we go back to the culture thing there, Joe. Yep. Good one, Gary. Yep. I think this has all been... Uh, Pretty good uh, conversation. Uh, I wrote down a couple other things as far as like learning, remembering things from everyday class, remembering, remembering things from seminars or uh, you know, online. They're different categories, but I think the the overall methods to remember things are similar. I think with a with a seminar, some of the seminars they show so much stuff. You either have to like latch on to three or four big things, or sometimes even just one, and remember that. Or take a lot of notes. If they let you roll a little bit of video, they, you know, a lot of times they'll say, "Hey, you'd film, but I don't want you putting it online." Well, respect that, and and be happy you're able to to take a little video note for yourself. Uh, also, sometimes I see students will pair up and do it them, you know, like so. Gary and I, 
let's just you know we we Gary mentioned that seminar we did with Rolly Delgado was amazing, but and I don't remember what Rolly said about video, but let's just say we wanted to make a little video. Gary and I could do the video ourselves. Like, okay, here's this, and then I you know hook the leg here and and reap the knee here, <laughs> but uh, he, Rolly didn't have to be in it, and I don't have to put that online anyway, but. I, I just think that, you know, making a little video note isn't a bad idea, especially after a long seminar. But yeah, I was going to bring that up too, Byron, uh, you know, about doing a little video, just, you know, maybe you and your training partner, just uh, something you can watch, uh, you know, when you're at home, just to keep it in your head there. Yeah. I also like that to you, you mentioned that you and Gary went together and if you're going to a seminar two hours away in the next town, man, invite a friend to go with you. You know, if you both go, then you can talk about it and, and you can remember what he forgets and he can remember what you forgot and you can put it all together. And, and that might be really valuable. Yeah. You know, as you're talking about seminars like that, um, you know, especially let's say you're driving, you know, on the way home, you got two hours to just talk about it. But, you know, even if it's close and you're trying to retain more from a seminar, I think it's good to you know, have a training partner, somebody that you train with all the time. Um, you know, I know a lot of times you, you go to different, you know, a bunch of different schools are there. You may go by yourself, which, you know, is a little bit different, but it just seems like if I can, you know, drill with somebody that I see a lot that I'm going to, you know, see a couple times a week, it's, it's easier to pick that person's brain than, than grabbing a complete stranger, you know, which is always good to, to get to meet people. But I just don't think I retain as much with a complete stranger than I would, you know, if I was training with Byron, uh, somebody that I'm going to see a couple times a week that I, you know, I can just talk to and, and ask uh, questions to. Another thing that uh, I didn't have down here, but I was thinking about it. We, everybody does this. We kind of subconsciously outsource parts of our memory to other people. And the, the best example is if you have a spouse, let's say me and my wife are out and somebody tells us, you know, so-and-so is getting married. And I'm going to forget that probably pretty quick, but be, partially because my wife is there and I know that she's got it. And so next week I ask her, who is that? They said was getting married or pregnant or whatever. I don't remember what it was. Oh yeah, it was a marriage and these people are getting married in July. And so just by the fact that she's there, that part of my brain doesn't even try anymore. And, and subsequently, like when, when somebody like that passes away, you feel like you've lost something or, you know, a, a divorce that like you've lost part of yourself. You have lost part of yourself because part of your memory, you've just outsourced it to somebody who's no longer there. And so that's a whole different topic. But we do this with training partners as well. At that Roy seminar, I think I was trying to pick up a few things and I was outsourcing a lot of it to Gary's brain that I knew he'd be able to show me later on because, you know, this is in Gary's wheelhouse. He's going to remember things anyway. And, and, you know, not all memories are the, are equal. I remember being out with my brother-in-law and he saw a phone number on a flyer. And like three hours later, he picks up a phone and calls it like a landline. Dang. I'm like, what are you, like, what are you, who are you calling? He's like, I'm calling that thing, uh, you know, about the, I don't know if it was a dinner thing or I don't remember what it was, but uh, I'm like, how do you, how do you, because I, I saw it and I remembered it. Like, okay, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> But, I got to check my contact list before I tell somebody what my <laughs> wife's phone number is. <laughs> but, you know, I, I do think that uh, as students, we've outsourced a lot of our memory to our coaches. Like, okay, I'll, I'll ask, the, I've got most of it down, and that's fine. It, ask coach again next week. You know, you showed this last week, and I didn't remember all of it. Show me again. And and they should show you and, and be happy with that. But uh I guess that's a kind of a, a workaround as far as remembering things is, is utilizing your teammates, utilizing your coaches. They all have uh, different ways to remember things as well. And some things people are – like I knew Gary's going to remember those leg locks better than me because that's something that he uh, is better at anyway. And sure, if, if I was teamed up with a, a first-day white belt and they were like wanting, working these leg locks, I would be the one that would remember most of it. Not that it would be more than you, – you, you're only going to get these three things, but that's what we're going to remember as a group or as a team. But uh, just kind of remember, some teammates are better at remembering things than others, and then some have certain categories that they'll pick up on stuff too. You know, Byron, when you sent the email out with the uh, topic for this uh, discussion, I, just that day I ran across a Zen proverb on Facebook, and it said that knowledge is learning something every day. Wisdom is letting go of something every day. And I thought about how that relates to jiu-jitsu, and, and man, there's a thousand techniques 
And part of this might be just picking what's important to you and what fits in your game and not trying to remember all 1001 techniques. Yeah. There's so many techniques and you know, you, you learn so many of them, but you're never going to be a master of them all. Like what really works well for you. And, uh, uh, it, it's crazy. I'm using a guard pass right now that I probably learned 10 years ago, uh, passing half guard. And I, I used to use it with good success and I do not know why it fell out of my game or what happened, but I hadn't used it in so long. And I, I just happened to see a video with it, uh, probably three weeks ago. And, you know, I've brought it back into my game and, and kind of what I was talking about earlier, I always try to put myself in that position. So today, Roland, this morning, I probably put myself in that position 25 times to work on passing that same way. And, you know, I know my training partner was probably getting sick of me, you know, going to that same thing over and over again. But, you know, by the time I was done with it, I wasn't only passing. I was catching the Kimura off that top side arm off of it, you know. So it was just something that, you know, I, I haven't done in so long. I brought it back to my game and. And, you know, it's just like I, I had so m much in my head that if, you know, either I I let it go or or went somewhere back in my brain where I couldn't find it and totally forgot about it. But uh, it's nice to have back in my toolbox. Toolbox, Byron, not tool bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Uh, let us know. So we'll have this on social media. Let us know if you have some memory tricks of our, how, as far as how you remember jiu-jitsu techniques we like to learn from you guys. That's always fun. Absolutely. Whatever's in your tool basket, just uh, send it our way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm never going to live that one down. <laughs> <laughs> Joe just asked you to show him what's in your tool basket. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's it's a fun topic. I think it's something that we all struggle with as far as I forgot how to do this. And it, and it might be something that, that was you were shown a while ago or just a few minutes ago. I know I've been victim of that. You know, okay, break. Everybody go try the technique. And like, okay, what was happening? <laughs> I think I just checked out mentally while they were teaching technique or I took a little snooze because I'm exhausted. I don't remember what they were doing. And yeah, I think we all have different problems with memory sometimes but uh working around that getting through it and remembering things is always going to be helpful byron what were you saying what, what were we talking about again we're talking about uh submissions from the top uh, huh <laughs> did you say something <laughs> yeah oh, i only... think my memory's going and you're hearing uh huh it's tough getting old man it's tough getting old yeah so this has been the topic of the the show this week and I don't know if we mentioned this at the beginning, but last week of the month, we just have a topic episode, and it's kind of fun to get on here and bat a topic around and, and beat the memory out of it and see where it takes us. It's a little different than getting a guest on, but uh, the audience, you guys seem to appreciate it and enjoy the topics we get into. If you have a topic you want us to cover, send us an email, bjbrick at gmail.com, and we'll consider it for an episode. Well, that brings us to our article of the week. We've got this little uh, website that we've kind of taken a few articles from, uh, BJJ, and then Brick, like the building material, dot com. Uh, yeah, BJJBrick.com. There's an article in there called Five Things That Can Kill Your Guard, and it was written by none other than our very own Joe Thomas. Joe, I love I, – first off, like I saw the, the headline. I'm like, that is, that is you know – Joe is really getting it together as far as he's always written great articles and things like that, but that's like a real catchy headline. You got to read that. You got to see what's killing your guard. And if it's just one of them, like, okay, I'm doing this. I got to change that. So, uh, Joe, you wrote this article. Uh, what was your main inspiration behind the, this? Did you kind of, what spurred this article? Man, I'm just always looking for interesting ideas, things to write about and uh, things to improve my game and help other people improve theirs. And, you know, I, I'm not a smart guy. I don't come up with all these ideas on my own. Oh, I, we, we know that, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm, I'm always looking for content. I'm reading other articles, watching videos, and, and I'm always trying to really understand the game. And, and then I just take those ideas and, and put them in an article. And that was the case here. And, you know, I really appreciate... Uh, 
Jason Scully and uh, Nick Gregoritis. I'm sure I butchered that. I always do. But uh, those two guys, they put a lot of good content on uh, on the Internet. And, and they had a couple of videos that helped me uh, illustrate my first couple of points. And I don't usually try and put the points in order. And I didn't all four or five of these. But I did put a uh, strong posture and strong structure first for a reason. Because whether you're playing guard or any position, if you can't master that, it's going to be an uphill battle. I was thinking about like half guard and, you know, everybody says key keys to playing half guard or, you know, blocking the cross face and not getting flattened out on your back. And if you don't have a strong structure and a strong posture, you're never going to prevent that from happening. So I don't know if you guys have found that to be true or not, but I think that's really key. Yeah, Joe, I, I do agree with you there. The the strong, uh, you know, strong structure, good posture. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I know you looked at uh, Nick's uh, strong structure video. I was running into a little bit of issue with my half guard. Um, you know, I try to be very offensive out of my half guard. And, and sometimes I get lazy, you know, as they're trying to pass. Like, I think I can catch a submission off of it. and But a lot of times I wouldn't end up and I would just get smashed. Uh, once they pass and you know just having a hard time getting out or or you know then that guy just pulls a submission train on me so what i'd end up you know doing is you know what was wrong and really for some reason i couldn't troubleshoot it and figure out what was wrong but i happened to see a tom to blast video where he was talking about structure and on uh, half guard and as soon as i threw that structure out there and started working, you know, on the structure, everything just came right back into place. So, uh, you know, made a big difference for me. Yeah, there's so many keys uh, from different positions, like connecting your knee to your elbow and then uh, and then your foot to the ground. And, and that's yes. what gives that's what gives it the strength. If you're not making those connections, you don't have a strong structure. Yep. So true. One of the things on here that you have that could be killing your guard is not recognizing when your opponent's no longer actually in your guard. Um, what do you mean by that, Joe? Well, it sounds pretty simple, but uh, maybe a good illustration is uh, quarter guard, which for me is uh, the guy's three quarters past. <laughs> you know, there's there's not a lot of offense from quarter guard, but I've seen guys, and and I'm sure I've been guilty of this myself before. Where you're playing half guard, and they get their knee through, and then they get their knee to the ground, and you barely have a hold of their foot. And that's actually a good time to, to scramble. You know, you can get to your knees. You can turn that into a single leg. But, man, if you take that position and you're still trying to pull half guard sweeps and half guard submissions, it, it's just a losing battle. And, and from for every guard, there's a point where your opponent crosses that line from being in your guard to being inside control or whatever position they're going for. And Jason Scully has a good video out, and he explains, like, from the butterfly guard, where you've got about a 45 degree angle on either side where they're still in your guard. And once they pass that angle, you need to start defending. You need to start escaping. You need to start doing something else. You can't continue to try and do a butterfly sweep when the guy basically is already in, in side control. So I think that's uh, really key. And I have friends that say, well, I get all my submissions from transitions and I get sweeps from transitions and that's valid. But, those guys, they already understand this, and, and that's why they're good at it, is they, they realize when their opponent is crossing that line, and it's right at that point that you have the sweep. I like the lasso guard a little bit. I take my left leg, and I lasso their arm, and then I take my right leg, and I put it in like a weak knee shield position that's not really going to work, and it baits them into passing. And they pass on that side, and when they hit that point where they're right – going from in my guard to inside control, that's when you have the sweep and you can make a sweep from there. But if you miss that moment of opportunity, you just gave them side control. So I think whether you're trying to maintain guard and play guard or whether you're trying to catch people in transition, you really have to understand where that point is between playing guard and playing defense. Yeah, you said a lot there. I'm reminded of the idea that... Uh, Joe, you pass my guard, and let's say we're keeping score, and you know, we're doing our best here. I got like three seconds to to deny your guard pass. Otherwise, it's actually a guard pass. And if I start setting, okay, Joe's he's gonna pass. Like, okay, clearly he set up everything he needs to. I'm no longer offensive. 
I can't do what I want to do to avoid this guard pass. Start setting up your escape like right away, and then you'll be a little ahead of the game. And and that's something that you see in more advanced players. They don't just pass the guard. They pass to a, a side control that they're really happy with. You know, the arms are way out of you know, position, and or they're almost taking their back right away, or, or something like that. They're not just getting there, and, and okay, now we get to start from side control. It's like taking the back. Some people take the back and get the hooks. Oh, this is great. Some people take the back and get the neck. You. Yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, which one would you rather have? Like, yeah, the hooks are important, but so many people get the hooks and then struggle to get the neck. In transition, get it all. And and uh, recognize when is, is the time to, to start defending that guard pass because it's easier to defend a near side control than a solidly uh, lay down side control that you have to try to get out of. Those are tough. Yeah, I like your motto. People... I was going to say, I like your motto, Byron, get it all. <laughs> get it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, a lot of people get stuck flat on their back after a pass because they're continuing to try and play guard yep. when the guy's three quarter passed already. Yeah. But for me, part of the the success I've had with, with guards, especially like open guards, is having a good escape that backs it up because when you first start to play these, these guards that aren't, you know, close guard tight, you know, overhook, hold on, you start opening it up and trying to work things, your guard's going to get past. And so it's part of the process is to be able to escape and get your guard back and do it several times in one roll as opposed to, you know, get your guard passed and then, you, then you're screwed and that's the remaining time unless you get tapped. Nice. And, and another part of the thing that... um that's helped me a lot is, is understanding like your number three point, the other side of the equation. So, yeah, I kind I kind of thought about Gary with this one cause I haven't rolled with him, but, uh, I know he's a leg lock guy and, and I thought about playing daily heave guard or single leg X guard. And that might be something somebody wants to add to their game. And if they don't know what to look for from the other side of the equation, they're not going to see things coming. And, and those are positions you can easily get foot locked from if you're not careful. Uh, you don't understand the grips that your opponent's making. You don't know what to defend and what to prevent. And so if, if I want to learn a new position, I think it's very wise to learn it from both sides. Yes. It's hard to do at first because a lot of us are uh, guard players not by choice. It's just the position that we're able to obtain. If we, especially when you're starting out, if if you can't get on top, you're going to be a guard player and, and and you know learn that part of the game. But once you're able to get a couple of sweeps or maybe get top position, you'll see it differently once you're playing the guard. Like oh, you know, as a as a passer, I've got to do this, and as somebody who's playing guard, I have to stop them from doing that. And that seeing both sides of the equation is a huge deal. You know, Byron, you were talking about, you know, some of us are guard players, uh, not by choice. Uh, you know, we just get put there, and then sooner or later we figure out how to get some sweeps to get top position. But, you know, Joe's quote really hit me so well today. I, I just keep going back to that quote over and over again. But, you know, I do think if you train in a gym with a great culture, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to let you work on top. Um, they maybe want to work in, you know, on, on escapes, uh, you know, maybe working on escapes from their bad side against a lesser opponent, but they will let you work on top, you know, especially in these, these gyms with a great culture. So um, you are going to get that other side of the equation where you can, you know, work that. Um, and then, you know, once you, you'll start understanding what people are doing, you know, when they got top, you know, top side position on you versus uh, always being in the bottom there. That's true. It's just <laughs> back when we started, Gary, that wasn't the case. <laughs> it wasn't the case. Um, but, you know, a lot of gyms it, it is. It, it's, that's yeah. awesome. But was it the people we trained with? Was it the culture in our gym? I think it uh, was a, a culture of, of trying to learn how to fight and, yeah. and trying to learn how to, um, you know, if I could put you on your back and pass your guard, I'm going to do that. If if but, I can't, but I wonder if that didn't if it hindered our our you know our you know progress. Did it hinder us a little bit? I think it made us tough as nails. Um, you know, people were you know just got quit. You know, you got beat up so bad, people quit. But you know, I, I was a very slow learner. You picked it up a lot quicker than I did. You know, maybe I would have learned quicker. You know, I know we all have different methods that we learn better from. Memory but, uh, techniques, Gary. 
Yeah, yeah, memory tech things. <laughs> but I don't know. That that quote of Joe's really yeah. has got me thinking about a lot of stuff today. Quote of the year already. Well, yeah. Gary, you were already middle aged when you started, so your mental <laughs> faculties were already declining. <laughs> like me, uh, like me. Yeah. Joe, Joe's got my back, literally. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Gary, you're yes. familiar with the rock band ABBA? Yes, yep, I remember ABBA. Okay, that brings us to point number four, except with only one B. Yeah, Always Ava. be attacking. So I, I think that's something that kills your guard. If, uh, if you pull guard on me and you don't do anything, you don't attack, you don't sweep, it's just a matter of time before I pass. I mean, yep, it, it just it just seems that way. And uh, so I think that's one thing that kills people's guards. They're just not busy enough. They're not trying to pull the arm across. They're not trying to get grips. They're not trying to off balance. I mean, even if you're not actually attempting a technique, you still need to be keeping your opponent off balance, breaking their posture, keeping them busy. And uh, eventually they'll tire and they'll get frustrated and they'll make a mistake, and then you'll have the sweep or the submission. I think that's really key for any guard is just to be busy. Yeah, busy uh, is like you said. If you're not busy, you're letting my he- my mind start working. I'm going to start getting grips. I'm going to pass, and you know I'm going to be in side control. So you definitely have to make you know upset my balance. You know, as you said, pull the arm across. To, you know, try to get at a different angle. Uh, you know, sum- try to submit me. Always be attacking. And uh, it's going to make it that much harder. But I love that. ABBA, uh, always be attacking. Uh, we've had a guest on a couple times, uh, a guy that uh, Byron and I has trained with a lot, Brian Marvin. And he says ABC, always be choking. And, uh, you know, I've never heard always be attacking, but uh, I'm going to steal that from you, Joe. I, I like that. Awesome. And I, I got to go train with Brian. Isn't he from uh, Houston? Yeah, he's from Houston. Yep. Yeah, I'm going awesome. to send him a message when we get off the line here. And uh, Yep. Yeah, and if it's like when I roll with Brian, ABC, always be crying. <laughs> no, he's he fun to roll, but he's you, a huh? beast. Yeah, he's a beast. He's yeah. a different well, I'm going to see if I can't get him to come down and train with us sometime. Yeah, he, that's awesome. He's he's involved with the uh, Mission 22, and great guy, and, and, and really yeah. good at teaching as well. Uh, yeah, and he, I really support the concept behind Mission 22, so that's a good thing. So, Abba, is that the, the Dancing Queen uh yeah, man, <laughs> you got it. Yep. <laughs> we okay. If any of our listeners have any music ability, make us a grappling queen featuring Gary as the subject, and uh, boom, there we go. Wouldn't that be amazing, Gary? Grappling queen. You guys, all, you guys always pick on the old guy. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm the old guy. I thought I had you by a couple months. Okay, all right. <laughs> pick well, on any of us you want. Byron's the young guy. Yeah, we should be picking on you, Byron. That's okay. Hey, El- hey. Elder abuse. Hey, if anybody hears this, please turn Byron into social services. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to do this podcast. Byron's making me. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Uh, but, uh, you know, that would be a cool song, Grappling Queen. Man, that'd be funny. Yeah, that could also be a uh, Matt Tell, maybe, somehow. There you go. Yeah, a lot of lot of opportunities uh, are on the horizon. Yep. Well, Joe, anything else you want to talk about in the article, or save the last the little bit there for the for people who want to go check it out? Yeah, it was a fun article to write, and I hope people check it out, and I hope it helps somebody. And that's that's really all I have to say about it. Yeah, if your guard gets passed, go read the article, and boom, you'll have an invincible guard. Like <laughs> I don't know about that, but I don't know about <laughs> that, but hopefully it'll be something that helps somebody. <laughs> Awesome. Joe, you know what I like about your article? Um, I, I love it when people do articles and they include videos in there. Like you got Nick's and you got Jason's video. And, and you know, as I'm reading, sometimes I, I need a little bit extra. And I think that's I, – I love it when people do include that in there. So uh, I just want to give you some kudos on that. And, uh, it's a great article, so everybody definitely check it out and it'll help you out. Well, you know, I thought about it and, and you take a look at Nick's video – and I'd have to practically write a book to explain in words what he can explain in yeah. a five-minute teaching segment. So, yeah, it's a really valuable tool, and I plan on using it more in the future. Yep. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Patreon has been a valuable tool for us. It's been a way that we've been able to be a listener-supported show. Uh, if you like the show and you want to support us, that's how you could do it. Check out the show notes or go to Patreon. 
dot com and the easiest way to, to find our site on there is through the show notes. Pick a little I got a little picture on there. It goes to a little video where I explain it. Basically you you support us, you pick pick like a dollar of uh an episode. Every time we put an episode out, uh, you know, you'll you'll pledge a dollar at the end of the month. It, usually it's like four bucks and uh and that goes towards us and doing the show. We appreciate you guys on Patreon so much. Uh we're we aren't able to give you like a full, you know, hug and, and high five and a dinner but what we can do is a few things we have a a gee patch we'll send you in the mail along with a sticker so i'll get, need your address for those things if you don't you know want to send your address that's fine i can't send those over the email uh invite you to be in our private facebook group uh that's pretty fun uh, basically you know it's the way we talk with each other it's other patreon supporters and it's friends of the podcast that basically we know locally here and Sometimes we'll have a, a guest that's coming on in a couple of days, and I'll put up, hey, I'm going to have this person on. What should we talk about? And bounce some ideas off of some of the the friends of the show there. And you could definitely be part of that. And, uh, yeah, it's Patreon has been a big deal to the podcast. We don't have thousands of supporters. We have a handful. They mean a lot to us. We appreciate you supporters that are on there. And uh, we'd be happy to get a few more. Yes, thank you to all our Patreon supporters. And another way to support us, tell all your friends about us. Uh, let them know about the podcast. Uh, um, we really appreciate that and, uh, you know, get more listeners. And uh, hopefully from that, uh, we'll get more uh, supporters there, too. So uh, let all your friends know about the BJJ Brick podcast. Absolutely. And check us out on social media. Um, we're pretty active on Facebook. Try and put some interesting content on there. Byron, you've been doing a really good job with those audio clips from the uh interviews and getting good support so guys check that out uh, byron's got a youtube channel as well he's been putting some interesting things on there and be sure to download the bjj brick app that's the easiest way to get the episode every week here we go guys gentlemen fast money we've been doing this so every time we do it a little differently and uh eventually this is, i hope we'll bring this on and, and have this done to some of the guests so that'll be a lot of fun but uh, today we have no guests. We have a, a Joe and a Gary and a Byron. But uh, I play the Steve Harvey of the show and I do, do it poorly. I think we'll try it a little differently. We'll have you both available to, do the, to answer the question. Whoever gets the first question goes. And then somebody could try to, let's say, Gary, you know, name an animal that, that could live in your house. And Gary says, dog. This dog. And then, and, okay, that's the number two answer. What's the number one answer? And Joe gets a crack at it. And, and well, what if Joe gets number one answer first? I'll say congratulations. Number one answer okay. was dog. Okay. I don't know. So he wins. A little bit okay. of speed. It, and you know what? This is all experimental. Um, it's podcasting here. Maybe everybody talking at the same time is a terrible idea. <laughs> it could be a bad idea, but I know how you like to experiment, Byron. Yes. Yeah, so scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's more, think of it more as like the buzzer round. Where the two contestants are standing off at the front. Steve Harvey in the middle with a little note card. You guys ready? I'm ready. I'm as ready as I'm ever going to be. Okay. Yeah. We're, That's a crazy for response. Easy money. <laughs> easy money. Name something people put their name on. Zzz. Go. Uh, their clothing. Identification. Okay. That's the number eight answer. <laughs> <laughs> How was that number A? <laughs> Gary, Gary, three seconds on the board. it was a dumb idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a dumb idea. What do you got, Gary? Um, their house. <laughs> the mailbox. Yeah, uh, that's what I meant. But okay, mailbox is on there for number two. Yeah. Good job, Gary. I'm not going to keep track because this is too much work. Uh, uh, clothing got four points. So. See, I was thinking of clothing because, you know, you, you have a name tag on there or... Yeah. You know, I thought See, that was a good... Gary, that's because we're old. Yeah. We come from a time when our mom <laughs> sewed our name tags and our clothes. That don't happen no more. The the number one answer was personal check, which I guess shows some sign of age on the game as well. Yeah. Uh, okay, you guys ready for the next one? We're ready. Name an occasion that people frequently forget. Your wife's your wife's anniversary. <laughs> Gary, what do you got? Anything? I was actually going to say your wife's birthday. Okay, anniversary was number one. Birthday was number two. Hey, Joe, we killed that one. You guys are doing and good. I guess, in, I guess in hindsight, I hope it's your wife's anniversary. 
you hope not to forget that one anyway. Yeah. Uh, okay. Name something that men's magazines give tips on. Bzz. Go. How to get bigger and stronger. Exercising number four, Joe for the Steel. Dating advice. Number one Ooh. answer was women, so I'm going to say that's dating. Dang, Not Joe. specific to women, but hey, you know, there that's you go. close enough. Yeah. <laughs> you can date others. Okay. Name something a fireman doesn't want to be without. <laughs> I don't know who's first on that go. Somebody. Fire hose. Would... Hose versus. Gary, what do you got? I was going to say his fire suit. Fire suit. Uh, okay, uniform, number two. Yeah. Hose was number three. Water was number one. Okay. Gotta have that water. Byron, what would you have said being a fireman? Well, I could see the answers right here, number one. Well, what would you have said? Water is, I don't know, crew? Okay. I don't know. Yeah, you see, I work, I, work in an environment, <laughs> I work in an environment where water is not necessarily the first agent you want to use, so... <laughs> You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're dealing with either electrical fires or uh, uh, flammable liquids on the boat. So I would have said some sort of extinguishing agent, CO2 or something. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole different game. And that one that one came in 49th place, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Name something a telemarketer tries to sell you. Yeah, it sounds like Gary. I, I'm trying to and, determine who's zzz is who's, zzz, you know, so <laughs> that's tough. <laughs> What do you got, he's trying, to, he's trying to sell you to lower your interest rate on your home. Uh, I'm looking through this. I don't think it's on there. Well, I got that call last night. <laughs> Joe, do you I'm have an thinking, answer? Yeah, I'm thinking the warranty on your vehicle is expired. Oh, good one. Man, those are both good. I'm get- Number one answer was credit card. You know, that was the other one I was going to say, but I personally think Joe's better because I've got more of those calls in the last six months than any other call. Okay, I got yeah, a bonus one. How do they one. even know what car I'm driving? <laughs> they, yeah, don't. <laughs> they don't. They don't know. They just hope you have a car. Yeah. All right, I got yeah. one more. Name an animal you wouldn't want to kiss on the lips for any amount of money. Tiger. Joe? What do you, frog. Not, frog. Tiger was number two. I didn't mean to say Joe was the animal when I called you out there, Joe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tiger was number two. Frog's on the list. Number one was snake. I don't think snakes have lips, but I guess you do. Anyway, that was like fun, good. guys. Good work out there. Yeah. That was, yep. I don't know if that was better or worse, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it was different. <laughs> it was different. I think Joe and I, if we do that again, we should just say the answer because you can't understand who's buzzing. Uh, so I, maybe, yeah, it's, it's tough to determine who's zzz. Yeah. Well, maybe next time, Gary, you can buzz and I can ding. Oh, oh. yeah, there we go. <laughs> but we'll probably forget. Yeah. You know, but maybe we can, uh, you know, figure out ways that we don't forget to do that. We don't, you know, you practice your, you practice your dinging all week, Joe, and I'll practice my buzzing. (laughs) Yeah. We just, we just got to come up with a way to remember that. Maybe there'll be a memory aid. Maybe we can review and take notes. Yeah. Maybe there's a way to, uh, maybe there's a podcast that talks about that. Man. There you go. That would help. I can't remember anything that would, uh, we just seem talking about. Buzzers? I would check out the BJJ Brick podcast, and I would check out, uh, you know, the the latest episode, episode two twenty four. That would definitely Sweet. tell you. Yeah, yeah, if if you have trouble finding it, just hit the rewind button. or <laughs> go back to about the first ten minutes of the show, and that's yeah. basically when we'll start off. Yep, there you go. <laughs> I had fun this week, guys. Oh Me yeah, too. this is a great episode, man. Thanks. All right, stay sweaty, my friends, and don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, get better, and we'll see you on the mats, guys. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.